Uh, remind me why Radio Waves is the bandwidth of choice, because that was clearly displayed in Carl Sagan's novel, Contact, later becoming the film, the hit film uh, with the character Ellie Arroway. She was a radio astronomer, basically, who uh, is listening for, looking for radio signatures out there in space. And uh, the rumor has it that Carl Sagan knocked on your door a few times to try to get some insights into this character. Uh, can you confirm or deny those rumors? Carl was a member of our board of directors. He wrote a book about a woman who does what I do. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. <laughs> Perfectly put. Um, Perfectly put. That, that character is Carl. What comes across uh, as Ellie Arroway is actually Carl and his his musings and his thinkings and his um, – uh, it's probably too long to go into, but basically Carl would have loved to be able to have one more conversation with his deceased father. Uh, and that drove a lot of the thinking. Mm. Why radio waves and not visible light or any other band of the spectrum? The fact is that space is not empty, but there are clouds of gas and dust out there between the stars and uh, infrared or optical wavelengths are absorbed by these clouds and they can't travel very far uh, through the galaxy. We've never seen uh, the center of the Milky Way galaxy at optical wavelengths because it, it's just too dusty. But radio, the wavelengths of radio waves are not anywhere near the size of the dust particles uh, in these clouds. And so they basically don't see the particles. They don't see the dust and are not absorbed by it. So we've been looking at the center of the galaxy at radio waves from very early times in the in this scientific discipline. Any aliens would have to know enough astrophysics to conclude that radio waves would penetrate space in the way other bandwidths wouldn't. So we're assuming they'd be on exactly the same track we are in our l learning and understanding of the galaxy. At least at some point in time, they are or were, right? Because they could, in fact, create technologies that outlast their civilization. There are a couple of spacecraft in orbit around uh, this planet that will be there 10 million years in the future because their orbits will not decay. And now it's a really interesting question about whether what we're looking for and what is being transmitted uh, overlap in time in this 10 billion year history of our galaxy. That's part of the parameter space that you speak of so uh, dauntingly, right? Because you can search in frequency even within the radio wave bandwidth, you could be sending a signal or listening, for, trying to observe a signal in one band of radio waves, but then there's another bandwidth within the radio waves that could be where the action is and you would miss it. And maybe they sent a signal that got here 100 years ago instead of today, because there's light travel time for wherever it is. What's this analogy you gave to the ocean? It was the best thing I ever heard. What was it? about how, how much we have searched thus far for aliens. Because yeah. you hear people say, well, we've looked for aliens and we haven't seen any, so there probably aren't any. And it's like, what's your reply to them? My reply is that we've hardly begun to look. At one point when SETI turned 50 years old as a discipline, I did a calculation uh, that indicated that all the searching we'd done to date was as if we said, oh, we're going to look for fish in the ocean. And what we did was take one eight ounce glass and dip it in the ocean and take a look and say, oh, are they a fish in there? Well, there are fish small enough to have fit in that glass. But if you didn't see any, you'd hardly make the conclusion that there were no fish in the ocean. You'd just simply say, you have to look harder. That's where we are. Uh, we can do so much, but we can't do everything. And we are always looking 
or new way. If you had told me that calculation when I was just coming on and I wanted to be like a SETI researcher, I would have given up in that moment. <laughs> I, would said, I would have said, okay, I'm taking up another job. <laughs> <laughs> well, you might have. But on the other hand, if you're stubborn, you might have turned that around and said, wow, uh, this is one of the most interesting questions that humans can ask about themselves and their place in the cosmos. And, and if you were to succeed, you would, by inference, know that it's possible to uh, outlive your technological infancy and to have a long future. Because if the future isn't long for technologies in general, there aren't ever going to be any two that overlap in time. But if you find something, you know that there's a long you know, path ahead for us, potentially. We don't necessarily have to destroy ourselves. So that's a, that's a, that's a profound inference from such a simple bit of information you would glean. Let me see if I can restate it to make sure I understand it. You're saying if technologically proficient civilizations lasted only one or two centuries, and then they rendered themselves extinct, something bad happens, or it took them that long to even get to that point, and then it doesn't last long, then when you come upon a planet at a random time in its own evolution, because it could have just been born a million years ago or a billion or 10 billion, you don't know if you're hitting it at exactly that time. And so if everybody only were short-lived, nobody would be talking to anybody, and it would give us very little hope for the future of our fingerprint in this world. Is that a fair characterization of what you just said? That's correct. But if you don't go looking for it in as many ways as you possibly can, you'll never find it. You're an astrophysicist posing these questions, presuming that they have astrophysical tools. And I'm wondering if comedians were doing this search, would they presume that the other civilization would have comedians? <laughs> Is this, is this a natural <laughs> extension I, of our own bias? I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know about that, but I definitely know that I've played some gigs where I've wondered whether there's any life out there. <laughs> uh, intelligent life. Intelligent life. That's intelligent, sure. intelligent life, definitely. Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> is there anything there? Uh, let's head out to our cosmic queries about now. Uh, you've collected them, Matt? Yeah, absolutely. As always, um, Betty from Maine has asked, if you find life outside of Earth, what are you going to do with it? Yeah, Jill, are you going to conquer it and, and enslave it and colonize it? What are you going to do? Me? I'm going to tell the world about what we found and at least my interpretation of what that means. But the world is going to decide how they're going to react. Um, it's not going to be me that makes that kind of decision. And what confidence do you have that that response would be what you would consider appropriate? I don't know, Neil. Um, <laughs> That's not away. very hopeful. Come on, Jill. <laughs> oh, come on. Given the politics of our country, I don't know. But all I can say is that you'll know what I know. So Atticus from Soddy Daisy, Tennessee, who is 10 years old, says, the quote from Arthur C. Clarke, Two possibilities exist. We are either alone in the universe or we are not. Both are equally terrifying. This keeps me up at night in an amazing, not scary way. Please give your thoughts on the idea behind the quote. Oh, Atticus. Are 10 year olds <laughs> allowed to have these kind of profound thoughts? That's, I know. You also, also go to be bed, in the playground or something. Did you <laughs> <laughs> or at least not having to stay up at night worrying about it. Well, Atticus, we all share that. That profundity of thought that that delays your slumber, uh, and Jill, we want, let's hear from an expert here. Jill, uh, how, how, are both terrifying to you? Both are extremely significant. One uh, is not so hopeful in terms of the continued existence of life on Earth. The other on um, is. Uh, something that would be incredibly exciting and impactful to know 
Because if you know that somebody else has made it through this uh, very precarious technological phase that we're in, then, you know, there's an answer. There's some way to do it. And that inspires me anyway, to go looking harder for that answer. Here on earth. Yeah. 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 Somebody else made it through. We can too. Okay. I like that. (laughs) 